Welcome and thank you for joining us. We are letting the room populate and we will get started momentarily. Thank you for joining us this evening. We will get short, started shortly. We are letting the room populate. Thank you for joining us this evening. Just a few more seconds. We are still allowing people into the room. We will get started momentarily. Good evening and thank you all for joining us this evening. We are so glad to have you here with us tonight. Please note in order to have a distraction free event, we have uh, muted everybody and turned video off for our participants. Since our founding in 1913, ADL has fought anti-Semitism and the right to establish a free a, a fair and inclusive society. Um, as we know, misinformation and disinformation leads to hate, racism, anti-Semitism, and violence. For nearly two years, we have seen a barrage of disinformation and misinformation about the coronavirus, COVID-19, the pandemic, vaccines, treatment protocols, and the like. Today, we are here to talk about the dangers and the impact of disinformation and misinformation, particularly how they promote hate and violence. In fact, since the beginning of COVID-19 and this pandemic in, in our country, we've seen increasingly violent attacks and hate specifically targeting our Asian American, Pacific Islander community, the Jewish community, and our medical and health professionals. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our moderator tonight, ADL Southwest Regional Director, Mark Tobin, to start our program. Mark, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Margie. Today's program is part two in our disinformation series, which focuses on viral anti-Semitism, how COVID has led to a new form of viral uh, or variant of anti-Semitism. To discuss this topic, it's my pleasure to first introduce our three distinguished panelists. Dr. Peter Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Bio Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, where he is also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and holds the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair for tropical pediatrics. Since the pandemic started, online haters and anti-vaxxers have launched a new assault on Dr. Hotez, laden with anti-Semitic threats, messages, and memes that have invoked Nazi imagery, even comparing him to Joseph Mengele, and posting comments like, please sink your head in some holy water to cast out those Hitler demons you have. Joining Dr. Hotez is Dr. Gavin Yamey, the director of the Center for Policy Impact 
at the Global Health at Duke University. The center is an innovative policy lab that addresses critical challenges in financing and delivering global health. Published extensively on global health, neglected diseases, health policy, and disparities in health, including COVID, Dr. Yamey is a frequent commentator on NPR and has been a strong advocate for ensuring global access to COVID-19 vaccines. In a recent op-ed, Dr. Yamey describes being called a Nazi like a punch in the gut. In the same piece, he mentions that anti-Semitic slurs and attacks happen frequently and points out the trend of scapegoating of Jews during infectious disease outbreaks and the stereotyping of Jews as vectors of disease. Not only do I want to thank both Dr. Hotez and Dr. Yamey for joining us this evening, but more importantly, I want to thank you both for the critical work you have accomplished in combating COVID during this pandemic, particularly in the face of these heinous anti-Semitic attacks. Lastly, I'm excited to welcome ADL's Morgan Moon. Morgan is an investigative researcher for ADL's Center on Extremism, a subject matter expert on the alternative right and anti-immigration extremists and border vigilantes. Morgan focuses her research on far-right extremism in the United States and Europe and online radicalization. Her work focuses on the contemporary landscape of the far right during COVID-19, examining how economic, political, and social grievances surrounding the pandemic were adopted and adapted into far-right conspiratorial rhetoric. Welcome all. Dr. Hotez, I'd like to start with you. Could you please share how disinformation as well as misinformation of COVID has impacted your experience as a medical professional researcher and unfortunately a victim of hate and viral anti-Semitism since the start of the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for uh, having me. Um, you know, uh, my connection with the Anti-Defamation League, well, I've been working with B'nai B'rith for, for a number of years and was fortunate enough to be honored by them in 2017. But my link with the ADL really revved up this year uh, because of a, a new onslaught of anti-Semitic attacks after I'd written an, a an essay in Nature, which is uh, one of the major scientific uh, journals and there was a massive call of aggression uh, against me saying the army of patriots is going to hunt me down and all imbued with lots of Nazi uh, imagery and and um, a lot of pictures of Nuremberg hanging some pretty scary stuff and we had the Houston Police Department involved in the security at the Texas Medical Center but I was fortunate enough to get connected with Dina Marks who really was able to explain and in, in more uh, explicit terms, the links with uh, anti-Semitism, and I'm really grateful for her friendship and, and our, our connection since then. Um, the, the history of linking anti-Semitism to anti-science and anti-vaccine movements actually goes back to the time of Stalin and the doctor's plot and the great purge of the 1930s, where as part of, you know, an effort for totalitarian control, it was necessary he felt to attack the Jews and use the Jews as scapegoats, as scapegoats with, with devastating consequences. And that has gone, has it been a, a continuous thread since then, and unfortunately has really resurrected itself in a big way over the last few years. So uh, I started going up against anti-vaccine, anti-science groups uh, for more than a couple of decades. And it, I'm a vaccine scientist and I, I develop vaccines for neglected tropical diseases, and now uh, are, we have a we've had a coronavirus vaccine program for the last ten years, uh, and including a COVID vaccine that we're now accelerating is one of the first COVID vaccines specifically intended for global health, with the hope that it'll be released for emergency use authorization in a few weeks in India, and then globally. But um, the connection with the anti-vaccine group started a few years back when I wrote the book the book was called vaccines did not cause rachel's autism about uh, my daughter and who has autism and intellectual disability she's my youngest daughter where i did a deep dive explaining why there's no link between vaccines and autism and why um, there's no plausibility given what we know about the hundred or so autism genes including 
when we did whole exome sequencing on Rachel and my wife and I were able to identify a gene very similar to the hundred others discovered at the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT. And, and I remember Gavin kindly invited me to come to Duke to give a talk about that. But that's when it, that's when it first began. It started with you know a lot of targeting of Jewish physician and physician scientists, people like myself and Stan Plotkin and Paul Offit. But it really revved up around 2015 when the anti-vaccine movement, I like to think in part because we were able to debunk a lot of the fake links between vaccines and autism, took this pivot to the far right. And, and it happened here in Texas where to re-energize, they became part of the Republican Tea Party and uh, under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, political action committees started to form to make it harder and harder for parents to vaccinate their kids and easier and easier to opt out. And under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, it really, the anti-vaccine movement became very much a political movement linked to the far right. And it continued to accelerate 2016, 2017. That's when I started writing more, more and more about it because here I was in Texas and with a daughter with autism. And if I didn't say something about it, who would? And the, and the, the aggression really started to ramp up, um, including a fair bit of anti-Semitic comments. But then in 2020, it, it took a new dimension when those same anti-vaccine groups under far right leanings and health freedom, medical freedom, glommed on protests against masks and social distancing and ultimately COVID-19 vaccines with devastating consequences. Now we've had over 100,000 Americans who've lost their lives since May and June, despite the widespread availability of vaccines because of this defiance of vaccines and this, this kind of allegiance to belonging to the far right meant not getting vaccinated, which is one of the most self-defeating things I've ever seen. But a component of that has been very much um, with this far right wing extremism, uh, links to lots of Nazi imagery, lots of Im images of Nuremberg hangings. And so on a fairly regular basis now, I'm enduring emails and attacks on social media um, of people saying that the army of patriots is going to hunt me down and very much and always with a Nazi symbol or a, a Nuremberg hanging symbol. And so this has become now a deeply entrenched part of the anti-vaccine, anti-science movement, and it's and it's coming out of the political right. And um, and you have members of Congress now, um, you know, saying that they're going to first take your, uh, uh, they're going to vaccinate you, then they're going to take your guns away, then they're going to take your uh, Bibles away. And the subtext is it's it's the Jews who are doing this. And the message that's given to the Army of Patriots is quite clear because they flood my emails and social media with and, and threats uh, around my being, you know, one of the Jewish doctors and Jewish scientists, and it's part of a, a larger plot to take over the world. And the problem is it's, you know, it's, it's scattered in bits and pieces. It's not all organized for you to present. You have to kind of connect the dots uh, to make that connection. Uh, but it's very real and it, and it's very scary um, to to have this this element and and it's it's not easy to talk about. So we're in a very scary and dark place right now. Um, I think with this uh, and I don't even call it misinformation or disinformation anymore. I, I call it what it is, which is anti-science aggression that um, and I and, the, my, and my opinion and I've been writing about this, is that all of this is part of a larger attempt at authoritarian control. And, um, as, and as a part of that, we need to demonize certain groups and we need to demonize science. And now for the first time, we're demonizing scientists. So, you know, they're going after me and you can see this on Fox News at night, Laura Ingram goes after me and, you know, Governor DeSantis to Florida and and I'm, I'm not even connected to Florida, and I have Governor DeSantis going after me. Um, and of course, it's not just me. They're going after Tony Fauci and others. And so this, this is now a, a new element to the far right attacking science and scientists. And it's very convenient for that to go hand in hand with attacking Jews, right? Because so many 
scientists are are Jewish, and so there's that Jewish scientist element. And you know, uh, a few months back, I I came across a very interesting essay. It was written in 1941 by the at that time was the science writer for the New York Times, although it was written in the, the Journal of Foreign Affairs, and it's called Science in the Totalitarian State. And it, and it's has this eerie resemblance to what we're facing now, which is the targeting of science and scientists, uh, and and with it a, a big component of anti-Semitism. And and unfortunately, the, the Biden administration has not really been willing to take this on. To their credit, they're doing more than previous administrations have. But you know, it's still they're they're just kind of scratching the surface. Yes, they're going after some of the social media companies and, and, you know, hitting Facebook pretty hard. But, you know, as I say, Facebook is a part of the problem and they're par- partly responsible for the dissemination of this disinformation, but it's not targeting the source of the anti-science aggression, which now we've identified as three separate sources. And, and with that anti-science aggression goes hand in hand, hand in glove with anti-Semitism. So one is the far right wing extremism, and we saw this play out at the CPAC conference um, from members of Congress and a lot of the red state governors, and we're seeing this play out on on Fox News and other conservative news outlets. Second is um, what the Center for Countering Digital Hate, and it's amazing we have to have something called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, identifies as a dozen non-governmental organizations called the um, uh, Disinformation Dozen. And this is a very interesting organization um, based in Washington, D.C., headed by my friend and colleague, Imran Ahmed, who's you know identified these 12 disinformation groups. And the third one, which is a kind of a surprise for people, is the Russian government un- under Putin, who has launched this uh, syst- systematic program of what's being called weaponized health communication, where what the, what he's doing is using this as a wedge issue to destabilize democracies, but in particular the U.S., and flooding our internet and social media with anti-vaccine, anti-science messages. And so I've been calling this the triple-headed monster. And my last comment is this is the part that I'd like to see the Biden administration be more aggressive about, which is to create a interagency task force that goes beyond the health sector, because I don't think the health sector knows how to manage this, by specifically bringing in Homeland Security and the Commerce Department, the Justice Department, and even State Department to really look at how we start dismantling these these three components. So, so I'll stop there and, and, and hand it back over to you, Mr. Tobin. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Hotez, for a terrifically uh, cogent analysis of of this really extremely challenging situation. And uh, we do wanna get and talk about what some of the potential solutions are. Um, and, and, but we'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Yamey, um, your thoughts, you know, it, 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 Shakespeare said that, you know, first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. Um, I'm paraphrasing, sounds like uh, same goes for scientists now. Um, what are your thoughts as someone who's been so outspoken uh, about COVID disinformation and, and viral anti-Semitism as well. Yeah. So thanks so much for the invitation to uh, to join this panel this evening. I just want to say an enormous thank you to Peter Hotez. We all owe him a debt of gratitude. He is an international treasure in his service to science and uh, immense solidarity with him for all that he has gone through. It is orders of magnitude uh, worse than anything that I've experienced. So let me just say that, you know, even before COVID-19, I had experienced anti-Semitism. This is my first, uh, my first time was about 20 years ago. I think it was a taste of things to come. And I think the first time that you as a Jewish physician get called a Nazi, it's a real shock. Um, I wrote an editorial for the San Francisco Chronicle with another Jewish physician, that it was about prostate cancer screening. And back then the evidence on on screening was very weak and it appeared that whether you were screened or not your outcomes were the same and 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 we discussed this and it was in line with what the US government the UK government and the Canadian government were recommending at the time and this was pre-Twitter and pre-social media but there was email within hours of this piece clearly 
a highly coordinated campaign of hate came our way. Hundreds and then thousands of emails, abusive emails, emails wishing us dead, wishing us painful prostate cancer deaths, and a huge number of emails calling us Nazis and Mengele. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a blow the first time. Now I get called Nazi, Mengele, you know, all the dog whistles about Soros and, uh, you know, cabals every day. And I've sort of become numb to it, which is unfortunate and sad. You, you probably shouldn't become numb to it, but it is, you know, it is so common. The, the, the very first time it's like a punch to the gut. You're being compared with executioners, my own great aunt, uh, Shainala, which is Yiddish for beautiful, her and her family were massacred in cold blood by Nazis in Lithuania. They are in an unmarked grave somewhere. Um, uh, you know, the, the Jews of Lithuania were practically annihilated by the Nazis. And so when you're being compared to the executioner of your family, it's a blow. Here we are, 20 years on in the midst of COVID um, and in the social media era, you know, the, the accusations of being a Nazi and the anti-Semitic abuse is, is much more frequent. I'm open about my Judaism. My Wikipedia page talks about me being Jewish. Um, it, it, as you said earlier, Jews have always been scapegoated. This goes back to, you know, the, um, the Black Death. Jews were blamed for the Black Death. Uh, Hitler himself talked about discovering the Jew as the bacillus and fermenting agent of all social decomposition. Jews will always be scapegoated for infectious diseases. And actually, as Margie Levin said at the beginning, other groups, other minorities have also been blamed and scapegoated uh, during COVID-19, including uh, Asian Americans. And this is, you know, this is just, this isn't just my impression or Professor Hotez's impression. This is documented. Anti-Semitism has risen during COVID worldwide. I mean, this is, there is documentary evidence um, that this has happened, and it's happened in all sorts of ways, you know, Zoom bombing um, of synagogue services, um, you know, awful anti-Semitic tropes uh, all over social media, on Facebook, Twitter, 4chan, and the rest. Um, I don't study online hate. Um, it is not my expertise. I do have friends and colleagues uh, who work in that domain, including one at the Community Security Trust. That's an organization in, in Britain that monitors anti-Semitic hate and actually also provides security services uh, at synagogues in Britain. And they've, they've documented a number of tropes that are very common on social media about Jews uh, during COVID-19. In fact, they've identified uh, five main tropes. The first is SARS-CoV-2, this virus that apparently causes COVID-19, the first trope is it's fake and the Jews are at fault. It's a Jewish conspiracy. The second is, yes, it's real, but it's still a Jewish conspiracy. The third is that Jews are the vectors. The fourth is that when Jews die of COVID-19, we should celebrate. And the fifth, you may have heard of uh, the so-called Holocaust, um, is that the coronavirus should be used to deliberately uh, kill Jews. So these tropes are around. And let me tell you my own personal experience sort of day to day is that when I uh, go public, particularly on Twitter, uh, which can be a wonderful communication uh, vehicle for, for science, when I go public and support things like vaccines or masks, um, people get enraged. The anti-vaxxers come out, the anti-maskers, the anti-lockdowners, the COVID denialists, and they will invariably, there will be, you know, Jewish hatred, anti-Semitism, comparisons with Nazism. And I've had to lock down my Twitter account a few times. Um, the, the, the worst was not that long ago, a very famous Brit celebrity, actually who has ties with the Johnson government. I had said on Twitter that I support childhood vaccination, which I do. I'm, I, I'm very supportive of the adolescent vaccination campaign. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, that, there, that, that there have been trials in younger children. And I said this, and she said, you are like Mengele experimenting on Jewish children before gassing them to death. It's actually very upsetting even just relaying this. I replied, 
that I found that offensive, anti-Semitic and a form of Holocaust denial. She then replied, this is a very common tactic, by the way, how dare you call me anti-Semitic? I demand an apology. Then a very famous Irish media celebrity came to her defense. Oh, I know her very well, not an anti-Semitic bone in her body. And then before you know it, I'm getting hundreds of hate messages, a pile on coordinated by these two. And that has happened, you know, quite, uh, quite often. It is clear that, as, as Professor Hota said, anti-Semitism is entrenched in the anti-vax, anti-mask and anti-lockdown movements. And again, this isn't just my opinion. One study by the um, uh, Britain's uh, government independent advisor on anti-Semitism found that, that, that amongst uh, anti-vax and anti-mask and anti-lockdown groups on Facebook, uh, almost eight in 10 had posted anti-Semitic uh, uh, anti uh, content. Kevin, uh, can I, I hope yeah. it's okay, I can go off script yeah, of course, a little bit. I don't do. want to interfere with Morgan's time, but I just want to, I have one burning question. And it's one I meant to ask you for a long time is that one of the things that's happening is the way anti-Semitism is being manifest is they're accusing us as Jewish doctors, Jewish scientists, of being Nazis, of being yes. Mengele, of being, you know, Hitler and, and this and that. And it, is, it, is it that it's just a more socially acceptable way of advocating or, or saying that Mengele and the, the, the people like that are their heroes and, and by putting it on us? Because it's, it's, it's actually sort of twisted and reversed, right, to accuse us of being the, the, um, the, the, the Nazis. And, but, but I haven't been able to really articulate that very, very well. I'm just wondering if you've, I I'm sure you've thought know. about it. I'm just curious to hear. No, your I know. I don't, I'm, I don't know the motivation. I don't know the psychology. Well, it is obviously now sort of, um, you know, accepted, acceptable. Um, nobody even seems to raise many eyebrows. Let me just say, I mean, it's, al it's almost a way of showing your, a socially acceptable way to show support for for Nazi sentiments by accusing yes. the victim, yes. the Jews, of of being Nazis. And, and yes, and, and this but, is uh, yes. but I'm not and being very articulate a, here of it. It's a, well, no, it's certainly it's a very common tactic. Let me just say over the last few days, again, I'm not going to really sort of name names, but a very prominent um, uh, blogger, tweeter with a massive Twitter following, wrote a piece a few days ago criticizing public health measures now somebody's is, written here it's called darvo deny accuse reverse yes. victim darvo. and very that, interesting i'd never heard that term darvo. so you get called the offender if you call mm -hmm. out the anti-semitism and th i had this happened today a couple of days ago very prominent and morgan i know you're we're, we're cutting into your time so a, a very prominent famous person wrote a i found a very offensive um, piece about how public health measures can lead to the Fuhrer, he wrote, uh, uh, Hitler and Nazism. I said, I'm finding this very offensive. Hundreds and hundreds of Jewish health professionals felt the same and wrote to him. His fans have come to his defense to say, how dare you accuse this person of anti-Semitism? You must apologize. This is Davo, absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, blaming the- I, I hope you didn't. Uh, it, it, it is just, like, I, I'm in a position where I hear a lot of these things and just to, to hear y'all stories, knowing the kind of work y'all are doing in order to get us through this pandemic is, um, is, is just so, so troubling. And Morgan, um, you know, who, Morgan Moon, who mentioned, and she does do work in, in trying to understand what's happening. Um, can you share your thoughts and maybe shed a little bit of light of, of, of some of the whys? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'd really like to just thank um, Dr. Hotez and Dr. Yamey for the informative um, discussion and also for letting me join this timely and important plant panel um, as a representative for the Sonon Extremism. And so as mentioned, the Sonon Extremism has been tracking hateful messages and conspiracies surrounding the coronavirus um, since as late as December of 2019. And ultimately, the spread of anti-Semitic tropes and misinformation is not entirely new, but simply old tropes that are being repackaged into a modern pandemic and as a kind of a new variant or new veneer of pre-existing anti-Semitic tropes. 
And so I kind of just want to use this short time uh, to highlight some conspiracies, a lot which um, Dr. Yamey mentioned, um, as well as providing some data which the COE has collected on this new form of anti-Semitism. So let me just share my screen real quick. And so on this slide, you're going to see um, various examples of anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories weaponizing the coronavirus. And several anti-Semitic tropes are being used with regards to the coronavirus, but these are largely the same old macro conspiracies that have been around for centuries. Um, and as highlighted, you know, these, these conspiracies of the Jews as greedy, power hungry, and carries the disease have been around as far back as the Spanish Inquisition, Nazi Germany, and the pogroms in Russia. Um, and we've sorted these into four broad categories, but I think the five that Dr. Yamey highlighted are equally as um, relevant. And the just going quickly through them since we've already kind of touched on them is this idea of the coronavirus as a tool to expand, um, you know, Jewish global influence. Um, this dates back, you know, this idea that Jews have undue global influences and they manipulate events to expand their own power. This goes back to the Zionist occupied governments. Um, and here we see messaging that Jews or Israel or manufacturing are spreading the coronavirus. Um, to advance their control, whether this uh, and kind of being scapegoated for the virus and on the same relevant um, note are profiting from the coronavirus. And this goes back to this idea that, you know, they're profiting either off of a manufactured hoax where they benefit from the vaccine which they created or they're exploiting from market mortality or through loans. Um, a lot of this goes back to the age old conspiracy that the Jews own the banks and, you know, so on. And here in the pictures, you can see this, you know, this imagery of the happy merchant, um, which is a very anti-Semitic drawing of a Jewish man with heavily stereotypical features that we often see in online extremist chat rooms. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and another one we see is using the coronavirus to attack the state of Israel. Um, this content usually paints Israel as a malicious actor who has manufactured the virus. Um, and it's usually used as a critique to criticize the state of Israel's policies. And why not all of these critiques may be inherently anti-Semitic, there are some that pers uh, per uh, precipitate anti-Semitic tropes, for example, that Jewish citizens in Israel are the only ones being vaccinated. And finally, the last one we mentioned uh, with Dr. Yamey was that the coronavirus as a mean to kill Jews. We've seen this on uh, 4chan and Telegram, this kind of cheering on um, of the coronavirus in Israel as well as encouraging individuals to spread the virus among their Jewish communities, whether it be at their local synagogue or even just like propaganda that says like cough on your local minority um, and really truly terrible things. And recently um, the COE has witnessed a new emergence of misinformation and conspiracies as the United States grapples with the Delta variant and the third and in some states, sadly, the fourth wave of COVID-19. So for example, individuals blaming Delta as a side effect of a Jewish made vaccine or another way for Jews to benefit financially through booster shots and massive vaccination efforts. And so that was just kind of a highlight the imagery that we're seeing online on these like extremist ecosystems. But now to talk about kind of the real, the real world carrying out of these beliefs, which is, which is through our annual report on anti-Semitic incidents. And we've been documenting this since 1979, but in 2020, we saw the third highest number on record since we began tracking with 2024 anti-Semitic incidents. Um, we saw uh, in 2020, we saw situations at both the regional and local levels in which Jews were blamed for the spread of the virus. This led to expressions of hostility and anti-Semitism on social media and real world harassment. In fact, we saw a 10% increase um, of, uh, of acts of harassment on Jewish people. And we also recorded 31 incidents of assault involving 41 victims and, two, and 751 incidents of anti-Semitic vandalism. Just to like paint two quick examples, uh, for example, the candidate, a, a candidate for governor in Washington sent out a campaign mailer blaming Jews for COVID-19 and calling the virus the Jew flu. Um, in another incident, Jewish professors received anti-Semitic and threatening emails in which they were told that Jews are the real infectious disease organism. Again, forwarding these age-old tropes of Jewish people as carriers of disease. And further, I also want to highlight that why this presentation focuses on anti-Semitic incidents like solely this, that we've also witnessed an increase in xenophobia, anti-immigration, homophobic, and various other hateful misinformation and disinformation as it pertains to COVID-19. Uh, in many ways, we've said that, you know, anti-Semitic conspiracies often serve as kind of the canary in the coal mine, uh, meaning that when Jews are targeted throughout history, we often simultaneously see the targeting of other minority groups. Um, for example, 
Uh, the FBI hate base uh, hate crime data suggests that anti-Americans experience the largest single rise in severe online hate and harassment uh, out of any other minority group reported. And this is largely due to the bigotry and misinformation that blame Chinese people for spreading disease based solely on their ethnicity alone. Um, this information also led to the targeting and, uh, and physical assault of various um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islander communities. Um, and finally, what I was highlighting is kind of these age old tropes being rebranded to fit into the COVID narrative. But I also want to talk about new strategies being also um, used. And that is off, that is the um, case with the Zoom bombings. So Zoom bombings, which we talked about earlier, is the um, disruption of webinars and anti-Semitic messages and images through, by bad actors. And so in 2020, we recorded 196 Zoom bombings, which is 50, which 58% targeted Jewish institutions, including online prayer and Shabbat services, Torah study sessions, and Jewish school events. Um, and for example, in one case, um, a synagogue service on Zoom was disrupted by an unknown participant who wrote on the screen, can I order some gas Jews, about 6 million please, in reference to the Holocaust. And another incident um, during a Holocaust memorial program, um, students and teachers were exposed to profanity, profanity pornography, swastikas, and anti-Semitic slurs um, at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York during a Zoom conference. And why Zoom has stepped up their security measures, um, we in 2021 have uh, recorded 39 similar incidents thus far. And I will stop with that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sure. There we go. Thank, thank you, Morgan. And I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts after hearing both both doctors talk uh, about their comments. Um, what your responses would be to um, how they might, you know either respond or, or perhaps better understand uh, what they, they might be able to do from the perspective of the, the broader issues that you raised in your, in your uh, PowerPoint um, of how it fits into all these other uh, anti-Semitic attacks that have been happening. I'm sorry, can you rephrase so how they can address being targeted? Yeah, well, uh, I guess, let me, that was probably very convoluted. Um, so I will, I will rephrase that. So uh, really, what advice can you offer the two, two doctors in terms of how they might look at um, the, the, these tropes and any particular responses? That, that might be effective in terms of dealing with the attacks that they're receiving? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one, I think is I like to push report, report, report. I think that you should always report hate crimes to law enforcement. And in my opinion, I would prefer over-reporting versus under-reporting. And further, I think contacting other community and civil rights organizations regarding these incidents, whether it be not only the ADL, but there's, I mean, the Attorney General, there's the, um, the Stop AAPI Hate, um, and there's various other organizations that track and um, address these um, incidents, being the eyes on the ground and eyes of the community and kind of forwarding what is happening um, allows not only a more informed policy going forward, but also allows us to keep, keep uh, track of statistics and better reporting in our local communities. Um, but overall, I mean, misinformation and conspiracies will continue to be the lifeblood of extremist beliefs. I think COVID-19 is only one of these many variants that we keep seeing pop up. Um, and as current events, like the rise of the Delta variant, and as you know, the government continues responding to preventing the spread of the virus, um, individuals will only continue to be animated towards similar tropes and narratives around Jewish people. Um, and time and time again, sadly, we've seen how conspiracies and misinformation can motivate truly terrible real world behavior, which means we should take this seriously, which is also why I again push report, report, report um, to all these incidents. You know, part, part of the problem now is it's, you know, I'd be curious what Gavin has to say. It's almost so ubiquitous now. You just, you know, you, you can't keep up with it all. I mean, and, you, and, you, and they sort of wear you down. For instance, yesterday on Twitter or last night, you know, one, one jerk on Twitter was calling me Dr. Lampshades, you know, you know, with the, the obvious reference there. 
you know, and I just it was just, you know, it was the end of the day. I'm exhausted. I, you know, I can't deal with it. But fortunately, now I have friends and colleagues on Twitter who can, you know, pick up. But, you know, this is another part of the problem is it's there's kind of a fatigue element to it that uh, I don't know if you were on Gavin when I said this, you know, last night, some, you know, jerk called me Dr. Lampshades. Right. And and I'm just saying, you know, it's the end of the day. Yeah. You know, we're exhausted at the end of the day. Everybody's working hard as they can to fight this COVID pandemic. Yeah. And you just sort of, your resistance is down. You just, sometimes you just yeah. don't want to deal with it or fight it. And that that's where I think it's it's the problem is the volume is is so great yeah. right now. Yeah, plus Twitter does nothing, literally nothing. I've sort of given up on reporting to Twitter and, and I, I think, and and I think you know, the, people can can threaten to kill you, to murder. That's you, right. Well, the you. other, the other, I don't want to seem disappointed because it's beyond disappointing. Is it's not only coming from the riffraff, right? The, you know, the far right thugs. It's coming from a group of contrarian intel, intellectuals. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's coming from professors yeah. at major yeah. universities yeah. like Stanford, like UCSF, yeah. like Harvard, where it's become sort of a, a it, it's okay to say this kind of stuff and, and yeah. compare you to Nazis and talk about Nazis freely as though, I mean, you, you called it out the other night, um, uh, this guy from UCSF, you know, started uh, comparing uh, um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines to to nazism and it was just so over the top but that's the other scary part is that that the far right has cultivated a a, a bullpen a cadre of intellectuals from some of the best universities and think yeah. tanks in the countries yeah. to espouse yeah. these views and uh, indeed and and and, yeah. and so my one of the questions i've had is you know what's the money trail there and who's who's supporting this stuff you know there's i found one report um, that um, people say is not a reliable source, saying it's coming from the Koch family and, and, and others. But I think that's the other piece to this is trying to find the, the financial origins of it here in Texas, where it's been linked to the Republican Tea Party. It's coming from traditional Republican Tea Party donors. But I think uncovering the money trail of who's promoting these anti-Semitic views, I think is really important as well. And what what can uh, people who who want to help? What can allies do? So I so maybe I could just I mean I want to c c come back to what Professor Hota said and respond to you, uh, Mark. In 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 the same vein, is that Peter's right that there is an organized disinformation and misinformation network out there and. I've been really troubled by one particular network that involves the American Institute for Economic Research, a, a very right-wing, profoundly anti-vax um, group that has peddled awful anti-vaccine misinformation. They do have Coke funding. They are climate denialist. And the launch of this awful Great Barrington Declaration that really pushed for people to become infected, and which has now become a vaccine misinformation group, they're linked. The Great Barrington Declaration are advisors to an awful South African anti-vax group called Panda. There's a money trail behind all of this. Um, you know, conservative billionaires have funded some of these folks. And right now they are anti-mask. They are against test and trace. Uh, they don't believe in school protections, in workplace protections. They don't believe in childhood vaccination. Um, and they make these awful, awful, horrific analogies. You know, one of the Great Barrington Declaration authors said, you know, masking children is like being under the Taliban. I mean, you know, they are extremists. They are so far outside the mainstream. But as Professor Hotes said, these are folks at academic institutions, Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. Um, of course, they have academic freedom, but we need to recognize that they are part of these organized behind the scenes networks. We need to demonstrate to the public that these are organized networks with financial and other competing interests. We have to, in a way, inoculate the public, let them know that the views that they're hearing, sadly, these folks have become Fox News celebrities, the views that they are hearing now, um, the misinformation, the nonsense that they are peddling 
is outside the scientific mainstream. This is not this is not normal scientific debate where you agree on data and evidence. We agree, you know, that the, the vaccines are effective, they reduce your chances of infection, they reduce transmission, etc. You agree on the, 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 the rules, like the, the actual basic knowledge. Um, and you kind of you try and get ahead, but clearly they've been effective, you know, they've reached the highest you know, uh, levers of political power. You know, Donald Trump embraced them, embraced it and endorsed the Great Barrington Declaration. They are advisors to Ron DeSantis. You have seen the catastrophe in Florida. They are advisors along with um, Scott Atlas to, to, to DeSantis. So they've managed to reach the very highest, you know, uh, uh, tables, policy tables. So they, in some ways, they, we have to learn from their success. We have to learn from what they achieved and try and, and get ahead of them. I mean, try and kind of replicate this. Well, what they're doing is they're providing intellectual cover for, for failed policies. And they're providing intellectual cover to do what the politicians want to do. And, and again, this is, yeah. you know, I wrote this uh, piece in PLUS, uh, biology earlier this year called anti-science kills. And I trace, you know, back to Stalin and the great purge. It wasn't just a matter of wiping out the scientists. They had to create an alternative and they created an alternative, uh, collection of intellectuals to justify what in the, in the course, in this case, it was liquidating Vavilov to put in Lysenko to put in these vernalization policies. And on a smaller scale, that's that's what's happening. And and it was very interesting. I read uh, Anne Applebaum's book, um, her newest book, and it was you know she pointed out this is what uh, Oban uh, did in Hungary. You know he, he didn't dissolve the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He reinvented it with his own sort of pseudo intellectual uh, groups. And this is what. Bolsonaro in Brazil is doing and Duterte in the Philippines. So this is a, actually an established procedure and the authoritarian regime, you know, which is plays out nightly on Fox News and the conser OANN and the conservative news channels. And, you know, it's it's the CPAC conference saying, you know, vaccines are an instrument of political control. Part of it is you need to cultivate this group of of intellectuals this is what the intellectual dark web has become about it's you know you mentioned the american institute um so it's and that is very tough to go up against because they've got the imprimatur of of legitimacy there and it makes it much tougher and a lot of it is under the guise of you know free free speech which certainly people are entitled to but but as you all know, I mean, there are certainly uh, rigors of, of the scientific community, um, which in, in many cases, it doesn't sound like, uh, you know, that they're being being followed. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, you've mentioned early uh, in, in your remarks about a couple of things that the, you, you would like for the Biden administration to pursue, broadening um, out the, the scope of what you all think needs to be done in order to I at least roll back some of these um, some of these efforts, you know, whether it's something, you know, as simple as um, having uh, Deborah Lipstadt approved as the, uh, uh, the the administration's point person on anti-Semitism. But what are some of the other kinds of pieces that you think are, are critical and that, that we should focus on in the in the short term uh, to help alleviate some of these concerns? Well, you know, I'd be curious what Gavin says and 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 what Morgan says as well. But, you know, my my premise is this has gone beyond the health sector. You know, first of all, first of all, for years, even the health sector wouldn't deal with it. You know, when I would write an article like in the New York Times in 2017, how the anti-vaxxers are winning, I would get rebuked by the CDC. They would literally say, you know, Peter, we're not talking about this now. It's going to give it oxygen. And so the health and human services agencies have always acted as though everybody's got a compact computer and dial up modem and uses Ask Jeeves, um, you know, not recognizing how pervasive this has become. 
and now it's gotten way out of hand. So even, you know, Vivek Murthy, you know, the Surgeon General, who, who's a wonderful man, I, I love him to death, but, you know, he, you know, he came out with this thing, we got to go after Facebook. And again, it was just a little too small, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't really, they don't really understand that this is gone way beyond what the health sector can accommodate. Ultimately, you know, 100,000 Americans over the last uh, few months, including 10,000 in Texans, died by anti-science aggression, you know, defiant, being defiance of, uh, defiant of vaccines. Anti-science is now a leading killer of Americans. And, you know, and the point is we put up a lot of infrastructure to go up against, um, to go up against nuclear proliferation or global terrorism or cyber attacks. Anti-science has killed far more, anti-science aggression has killed far more Americans than any of those things combined. And, and I've made the point that the people in the health sector don't know how to deal with this. We need the experts coming from Homeland Security and State Department and Commerce and Justice, use the full power of the US federal government to see what levers are available um, to educate us on what we can do. And, and that goes also for the UN agencies as well. I think this has gone way beyond what the World Health Organization can do. We need, um, you know, we need all of the UN agencies to, to do that. And nobody really wants to take this on. It's, it's inconvenient. It's, um, they see it as a no-win proposition to get involved in this. Certainly, you can't get private foundations uh, in, involved in this at all. You know, I've, you know, written modest, you know, small proposals, one pagers, two pagers, to a number of private foundations, and they don't want to touch it with a ten-foot pole. They just see it as a no-win, no-win situation, and they don't want to get dragged into the attacks, which of course they would. And, and both of y'all work for prominent institutions, and, and I'm not just asking you to necessarily talk about the, your internal politics, but what kind of support are, are y'all receiving from the general academic uh, you know, world and institutions the, the, themselves? I'll just say one word, then I'll let go. I mean, you know, privately, everyone's very supportive, but publicly, you know, it's been taught. I mean, the National Academies have not really taken this on in a big way, I'm sorry to say, and, and, and neither have, you know, with the exception of one, which is, you know, one that I've been very closely linked to, the American Society of Tropical Medicine. Uh, most of the academic and professional societies kind of want to take a step back from this because they don't see how they can, how this is, they, they tend to be pretty risk averse. And, th and that's tough because, you know, as, as Martin Luther King once said, not that I'm comparing any of us to Martin Luther King, but, you know, he once said, it's not even the words of your enemies, it's the silence of your friends. That's the hardest part. And, that, and there's some truth to that, 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 you know, that we, we don't have uh, an institutional way to really back scientists. And I've even made the statement that we need something equivalent to the Southern Poverty Law Center for science and scientists to to back to back us up and and to defend us when we're attacked because the other thing the other weapon they like to use is they like to threaten lawsuits so um david gorski i think calls it what legal thuggery right that um that they put up these phony lawsuits and it's scary right to get a a, a letter from a lawyer saying they're they're going to sue you and and because as scientists, you know, our means are modest, right? To, so we depend on our institutions, which in my case at Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital, they've been great, but not a lot of, not a lot of scientists are. And Morgan, I don't know, maybe you have some um, idea, but what, what percentage, if y'all had to guess, of people might fall into this, uh, you know, uh, anti-science aggression or anti-vaxxer or th th these categories uh, that within the, the population of our country right now? Um, according to a June study by Texas A&M, uh, it, it said that 22% of Americans self-identified as anti-vaxxers, uh, which is quite significant if you take account for, you know, 
the Delta variant and the rise of like this next wave of COVID-19 and also the rise of misinformation and conspiracies. Um, but that was, yeah, according to a Texas AM study by the public, uh, by the Center of Public Health. That's impressive. Wow. Just one other thing to add, there was a very lively and interesting conversation today among some academics who some years ago were trying to get funding to study the anti-vax movement and they couldn't get any, no research funders are interested. And that's another part of this puzzle as well, that we're gonna clearly have to understand their tactics better, but you know, research funders are risk averse and don't wanna fund research like that. Uh, so I guess I just sort of have to ask, I mean, you've touched a little bit on it, but um, how do y'all manage day to day? I mean, I know how challenging it is just to do things during this pandemic, and um, y'all are obviously in the in the thick of it. And what do you, what do you do in the face of these challenges, just personally, in order to to keep to keep going and focus on the work of saving people? I mean, uh, so so, Prof well, we want to hear from Professor Oda because obviously, as he has been the you know, the subject of truly vicious, dangerous attacks and with real threats of violence. My haters are all, I think my haters are bluster, to be honest. They say they're gonna kill me or execute me, but it's, you know, I, I've never felt that they are real. Um, and uh, my university has been very supportive. I think if there was anything that I thought was, had escalated to something that looked real, um, uh, I'm sure that they would be even more supportive. So the, the, you know, we are all motivated by doing what we can to end the pandemic. As Margie said right at the beginning, our team is working on issues like global vaccine equity and, and you know, funding, uh, trying to mobilize funding for, for COVID-19 vaccines and so on. So we, you know, we stay focused on, on our work um, and, you know, on Twitter, I, I, you know, I get a lot of this kind of stuff. I try and, I just try and uh, use it, you know, use those moments to educate folks. Uh, you know, these last few days have been rather fascinating with this particular piece that, you know, that many, many, many people were so outraged by. And then the defenders of the piece accusing Jewish people of getting upset and causing the trouble themselves and, you know, a lot of victim blaming, and it's but it's actually I think been quite a uh, a good way of showing folks what's going on. And there's been a lot of solidarity from non-Jewish allies, I would say, many of whom have written to me or phoned me. Yeah, and and, and I says people... one of the things you do really well, Gavin, is and and we both do it to some extent. We use Twitter as an educational tool to explain what the anti-vaccine movement is, where it's coming from. So when you see a, a you know a gross attack, rather than yeah. simply blocking, which I'll often do also, but is to educate others to say, okay, this is where it's coming from, this is the source, and people find that very interesting. And certainly, you know, I see you know your stuff on Twitter, Gavin. It's extremely important and helpful, yeah, not I mean, just to simply block me, it, but to but yes, to explain uh, it, right? Exactly. A lot of people say, why don't why are you bothering? Why are you wasting your time? Just oh, I get that all the time. You're giving it a voice. I yes. said that's. That's that's 1990s, right? Now we're, we're <laughs> trying to educate people, and it's. Extremely... I use it as a moment to say, look, this is what is happening. If you're a Jew working in public health right now, this is what is happening. You need to understand that this is organized. This isn't, you know. So that you use it as a teachable moment. I think you try yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, and for me, you know, I mean, no, for me, I have to get through my day, right? So we're trying to accelerate a vaccine for uh, for India, actually a halal version for Indonesia of all of all things, which is very exciting. So, and that's, that's the, the most important piece of the, of this to try to move that through. I try to use humor whenever I can. I mean, you know, when they say the army of Patriots is going to hunt me down, I say, it's look, it's just me. And I mean, most of my kids are out of the house now. It's just me and Ann and Rachel and the cat. I don't, you don't need a whole army of Patriots. I mean, I'm, I'm one a, Patriot, maybe cat, two though. Patriots, if you need two Patriots, but you know. I hear the uh, cat's piss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, never know about uh, about, about the cat. And um, Doctor, has someone asked in the in the chat about something that maybe it's a book or something you're working on called Science Tycoon or Tucon Tucon uh, Science? 
Can you maybe elaborate? Yeah, it's 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 a bit half baked, but I I think there's some meaning to it. It and it goes of course to the ancient Hebrew concept of tikkun olam, repairing the world, and it was meaningful to me because it was taught to me by my cousin Rabbi Lazowski, who uh, was a Holocaust survivor. Remember that article in the New York Times a few a couple of months back called "The Jews in the Woods," how they hid in the woods and were protected by partisans. He was one of those you know oh. Jews in the woods and just sure. saw horrific tragedy, became a rabbi in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And and he taught me this concept of tikkun olam, repairing the world. And and I, you know, said, well, you know, many of us as scientists, although we don't articulate it, in fact, we're driven by humanitarian causes in our science. And so I put a label to it, science tikkun. And I've written a couple of papers that I've not been that happy about. Now I've written a third one, which I'm trying to get a, a journal editor to accept, um, which articulates it even more. And maybe it'll be the topic of, of the next book that, you know, this is what a lot of Jews in science do. We, we do this because, you know, we're, we're not only interested in the pure science, we see this as a humanitarian pursuit. And it's a thread that not enough of us articulate, even though we feel. Uh. I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I think we'll we'll leave it um, on that uh, on that extraordinarily uh, positive note. Um, this has been a, a really tough issue to talk about. Uh, that is something that is not clearly going away any anytime soon. Uh, but I want to thank you both for sharing. I want to thank Morgan uh, for helping us better understand. Uh, the depth of, of this issue as well. And I want to thank all those who have joined uh, us here at, at ADL. Uh, and I encourage all to, um, to do more with us and do more in order to help alleviate the issues that are being created uh, by whether it's disinformation and misinformation, but also uh, by what is clearly an intentional effort uh, in order to, to thwart our, our democratic endeavors whether through healthcare and through so many of our institutions. Uh, if we are going to be successful in moving beyond it, it is going to take all of us. And so I thank you all for joining us. And uh, particularly, I want to thank our, uh, our panelists for, for their time and for, for all their work. Um, it is absolutely invaluable. Thank you all Thanks very much. Thanks to the ADL for night. hosting. Thank you so Yes, much. thank you, ADL. You're, it's you're our, the best. It's our, the it's best. our pleasure. And uh, thank you, Margie, again, for, uh, for your work in producing. Uh, and uh, everyone, please have a, a good and very safe night. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.